welcome. Thank you so much for being here today on my conversations about ADHD. Um, my name is Amber and I'm an ADHD coach and also a therapist. So Kat, I want to ask you a little bit about you because I'm excited about our conversation. It's going to have, it's going to be about play and ADHD and mental health. So tell me a little bit about yourself uh, personally and professionally. Yeah. Well, my name is Kat. Um, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I'm a licensed counselor here and I'm also a registered play therapist. I have been doing this work as a clinician for over six years. And in that time, I've worked with so many kids and families and I've kind of like noticed a link or a commonality between all of the, the families that I've worked with or a lot of the families that I've worked with in that there's a common theme of parents bringing their younger children to me with behavioral problems, whether it's like excessive temper tantrums or not listening, not following rules, um, you know, kind of those difficult behavioral problems and kind of wanting me to fix them or fix the problem. Um, and, you know, as a counselor, you know, it's my job to kind of build a relationship and a rapport and trust with a child and that's kind of the essential piece to making those changes happen. But understandably, because parents are dealing with those behavioral problems at home, like they want a quick fix or they want something to change more rapidly than like any therapist really has the ability to do. We can't force our kids to like to change um, overnight or to change really rapidly, especially if they're kind of working with somebody they've never met before. You know, I recognize that like it takes a while to feel comfortable with someone new. Um, but as a play therapist, I also know that, um, you know, kids first language is play. Kids need play. It's essential. Um, it's how they speak. It's how they communicate. It's how they learn. It's how they process. Um, it's how they explore their world. Um, and I think a lot of times with adults, we're, we're talking to them a lot, or we're trying to use verbal communication to teach them and to talk to them when really they need play. And, um, you know, I have kind of adapted a curriculum that I've used before to create my program, Parenting with Play, which is a program where I teach parents how to have weekly play sessions at home with their child. That's in a similar fashion to how a therapist would do it in the office. But the way that it's different is parents already have an innate trust and bond with their child that's just there from birth. And so these play sessions can really change the course of that parent-child connection really a lot faster um, so that behavioral change can start to take place much quicker than it would with a therapist um, because they're not having to build that from scratch. And so another piece to it too is, you know, parents don't, you know, it's kind of, you, you would think that parents spend a lot of time playing with their kids, but, you know, the more busy we get these days and the more like connected we are to like social media and, and, and our phones and technology and just like always being connected, parents don't really take that like uninterrupted time to like close the door, put the phone away, get on the floor, like, and just like without structure play with their kids. Um, and it's actually something that kids really, really need both for like decompressing and for exploring and learning and teaching themselves. And so I really do a lot of that in my parenting with play program, how to have those unstructured play times, which it sounds like it would be easy just to have unstructured play time, but it's actually really hard for parents to not want to like, like, make suggestions and make evaluations and like kind of guide them because a lot of the play parents tend to do with their kids is very like teaching and like you know trying to involve some kind of structure or element of learning to it but and that's good in some senses like kids do also need that but you know we also need that more unstructured time so um my program does that and then also you know it's skill building as well teaching parents how to you know, the first level of my program, it's it's actually um, three levels that I've created. And the very first level is Tantrum Tamer. And that's a four week, at minimum four week program where parents can learn the skills on how to deescalate a child when they're in a temper tantrum, um, mostly through um, emotion coaching and 
kind of being with their child in their emotions as opposed to trying to solve the problem. Because I know parents like to go into problem solving mode, but that's actually a lot of the times not what kids are looking for. They're looking for someone to empathize and like, you know, like the things that maybe cause a tantrum for a child may seem minuscule to us, but they're little people, you know? So like the smallest thing is a big thing for them. And so they just want someone there to be like, you know, that's really hard. Or like, that must've made you so angry. And like, I'm here with you. I understand. And then when things are calmed down, you might be able to, to kind of do some lessons or like, you know, kind of like skill building with your child around like emotion yeah. regulation, but really like how to deescalate first. I love it. Yes. All of those things are so necessary. So it really sounds like you're using play not only as a way to help children calm their bodies down, but then also helping them, helping parents learn how to connect to their child again and get out of their head and get back to maybe a, a mode of communication that relates better to children because children aren't going to have that emotional vocabulary and, and all the proper ways of doing things that adults sometimes try to teach. I right. love yeah, I love that. And so that um, tantrum tamer, the four weeks, it sounds like that's something where you teach about emotions and then you also incorporate play into it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I teach the lessons on, you know, de-escalating and emotion coaching in that lesson, but I also teach in, and, and kind of help parents build a toy kit that they'll use weekly during these play sessions that they'll have with their child. And then in subsequent meetings that I have with them, I'll actually watch video clips with them of their play session with their child. Um, and so that way I can say like, okay, maybe try and like not be, or, or kind of like give some suggestions on how to make that play time more effective. Um, because a lot of times what you see in those play sessions is parents trying to guide and, and kind of like control the play session a little bit too much. And so and it's kind of hard to know what to do. And so like, I kind of give some suggestions on how parents can, can um, maybe scale back the questions or scale back the suggestions and just simply reflect. I teach them how to just reflect what their child is doing, what the feelings are that their child is portraying through play, as opposed to, hey, maybe we should do this with these toys or like these toys should be talking to each other. Like these dolls should be talking to each other or these um, you know, we should build a tower with this Play-Doh, you know, it's kind of like putting the child in the lead and kind of just the parent is the follower of the play. Yeah. And that's a hard role for a lot of parents to take sometimes, but it's essential to just be that genuine connection and listen and to value what your child does. Like having them feel valued, having them feel heard. You're and learning that's important. Yeah. It's like, you're learning how to enter your child's world for a few minutes and see the world through their eyes in a way that you don't on a daily, regular basis. Yeah. That sounds necessary for the adult as well as the children. So yeah. I, I love that. And a child's world can be full of just as many of emotions as an adult world, but on a different, in a different way. Um, what toys do you recommend or what kind of play do you um, recommend? Or is it tailored to each family and interest? No, it's, it's pretty much the same across the board. So like I said, um, before we meet for that, or like when we meet for that lesson, they also learn how to build a toy kit that they'll use during those special play times. Um, mm -hmm. And the toy kit um and the purpose of the toy kit is it's special and it's reserved for that 30 minutes a week that they have their play sessions so um by having that connection too it like helps with the relationship building mm -hmm. um and so what i recommend parents get for those toy kits is actually like the most basic toys you can find like nothing too flashy um so the more basic the better and you know the the idea is to have toys from certain categories of toys. So like one category is real life toys. So toys like baby dolls, um, people figures, um, toy food, toy money, things that they see out in the real world or might see within their household or their family. 
um, having some creative expression toys. So like Play-Doh, drawing, paper, you know, like colors, paper, like art supplies, and then aggressive toys. Like you want to have some toy weapons. You want to have maybe toy handcuffs, toy, like things that allow your child to, you know, cause like you're helping them communicate using play and they may need, like they need some aggressive things in there to communicate things, um, which is the, the purpose behind that. So for these, and, and I emphasize that like these toys are for the special playtime. It's not necessarily things that they'll be using outside of that playtime, but it's very specific. Um, and so I know parents get kind of like, sometimes can get worried when I suggest that they put a toy gun or a toy weapon in their, in their kit, but it's because, you know, it offers an opportunity for communication that that needs to be there for because, you know, aggression and weapons are a part of our world and culture. And that might, you know, you know, that might be something that they need to talk about. Um, but also it it's an opportunity for parents to kind of because in some of the later courses I teach about limit setting, which there are sometimes to set limits within the play session. Um, and you can use the toy weapons to set some limits around like what you want kids to know about as far as guns go or weapons go and like they're going to learn about it from somewhere so having that there gives you kind of an opportunity of maybe getting to that first totally and and i think anger is sometimes uh pushed aside, pushed down, not talked about as much. You're not supposed to be angry. You shouldn't be angry. All those things that I don't necessarily agree with. <laughs> and so, yeah, having that time to be angry and play angry um, within limits, like you said, it sounds very important. Um, yeah. I remember a family therapy session I had with my family and I was, I was probably eight and the therapist had pool noodles and we hit each other with pool noodles in the session. That's the only thing I remember about that family therapist. <laughs> pool, yeah. noodles. pool noodles might not be a bad thing to put in your toy kit, honestly. Um, yeah, it's something that thing. helped get aggression out in that moment. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, let me ask specifically, um, so with regards to ADHD, I know that temper tantrums can be a part of ADHD and meltdowns, um, hyperactivity, et cetera. What approaches would you specifically recommend to families that are affected by ADHD? Yeah. I mean, I do think that kids with ADHD definitely need that playtime, maybe even more so than non-ADHD children. Um, they may need that time to connect. I mean, all kids need that time to connect, but like that one-on-one, -on -one, that unstructured time to kind of remove the, the, like the mask of trying to perform or trying to mask their ADHD all day long, you know? Um, and I say this for all kids, not just kids with ADHD, but kids on a regular basis are being kind of controlled and evaluated and critiqued and given limits and told no and told like they can't do certain things and it's kind of it can be overwhelming and it's a lot of like I'm trying to mold you and you can't just be you so um kids do need that time and I think for kids with ADHD it's especially important that they have that that time to like remove the mask of like I'm trying to I'm trying to like appeal to society, you know, I'm trying to like, especially in the school setting, like be what I'm supposed to be in front of all these people, you know, they can kind of let that go for a little while. I often talk about this with my clients, that mask of what we're supposed to be like, the neurotypical, like we're supposed to just be like everybody else. We should fit into the, this type of, uh, profile. We should do this. Yeah. It's exhausting. It is draining. It causes a lot of shame and self-esteem issues when we feel like we have to be someone else and we can't be ourselves. And especially like what you're saying, little kiddos, like they need to take off that mask of having to sit still and having to be good at school and sometimes just play and just be, right. be crazy and wild and creative and fun and all that. Yeah. And if you think about it, probably having to wear that mask all the time does increase temper tantrums at home because it's like, 
I am struggling all day long. Like I'm having to like constrain myself and, and put on this face for everyone. And it's, it's a lot. I would, you know, I, I can imagine that would be like, at some point you would hit your limit, you know? <laughs> Like our world is full of adults who are very stressed out right now. I feel like as a therapist, I'm, I definitely see a lot of stressed out adults. So it sounds like the play will also have that ripple effect of helping the adult let go of their mask and their stress too. Right. I think it, I think it can be very good for parents to maybe let go of a lot of expectations too, of like what their kid is supposed to do and supposed to be like, um, how they're supposed to operate, you know, just like getting to know your child through their language. I mean, Mm -hmm. I said play is their language. And so like, if you're not having that unstructured playtime, you're really not talking to your child. You're not getting to know them. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want parents, I want all parents to have that relationship with their child where when they become teenagers, they want to come to you for advice and they want your guidance and they want your counsel and they want your support. And if you do that now, if you start to build that time now where like, we're going to connect and you're going to be you for this, uh, like, you know, without critique, without evaluation, without this mask, without judgment, it strengthens that relationship and it carries for the rest of, you know, their life, you know? Yeah. That they feel like they can be heard, seen, and still be like uh, validated for being who they are. Yeah. Yeah. And I I have found like the parents that I've done this program with the biggest, the biggest feedback I've gotten from it is their child, like, even though they're communicating through play in this time, they have found that their child is more communicative with them outside of those play times because they're spending that one-on-one time. They are better able to regulate their emotions outside of that. They're better able to say to their parent when they're having a hard time, like they're better able to register those things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So that relationship is really important in your work and that relationship of, um, it's almost like genuine acceptance, play with genuine acceptance and the parent letting go of all shoulds and expectations and just kind of going with the flow with their child. Yeah. Do you put time boundaries on that? Do you recommend like 30 minutes or setting an alarm? Because sometimes parents might feel like, I don't have time for this. Yeah, I do kind of say 30 minutes a week is the good amount of time. That's how long I tell them to do the the weekly play sessions because 30 minutes is a really manageable amount of time. Um, And most kids only have the attention span for about that long too. So, you know, it's just like these bite-sized bits of play. And I mean, it doesn't mean you don't play with them outside of that, but it's like very intentional play time. Awesome. Is it scheduled? Do you recommend them scheduling at the same time? I do. I recommend that they try to keep it like at the same time every week, just because it's something that your child will look forward to. Like they'll start really like asking for it and wanting it. And so like them having that kind of consistency of like, I know I can expect this stress relief time or this mom and me time or this dad and me time Mm -hmm. Sundays at 10 AM. Like, you know, it can be really, obviously like life's life. And so like, that may not be perfect, but the most, like the more you can try and stick to it being consistent, the better. Yeah. And I find that's true with ADHD. It's like, you have to have a schedule and a time and lots of alarms set to remind you of that time. Um, because and yeah, actually, like the hope too, is like parents who do my program, it's kind of like, we're going to have check-ins along the way. So hopefully you'll, you know, and so that, that habit starts to get built, you know, with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you're coaching the parents, you're having sessions with the parents. Uh, It sounds like you're watching videos of the parents playing too, to kind of help guide them about how to really let go of the shoulds and supposed tos and be with their child, really be mindful and present with their child. Right. And it's it like, ultimately, like, it does sound stressful, I think, to some parents to think about like, just tracking what their child is doing and not inserting anything. But once you get used to it, like it really should be enjoyable. Like you should, or not should, I I hate saying the word should, but like it ought to be a really enjoyable time that you're spending with your child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds great. And it is, it's play with structured boundaries, but play also where 
it's free during that time. Yeah. It's not a, as an activity that has been micromanaged. It's an activity that they just go with the flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So besides recommending to continue like the same time every week of having 30 minutes of play, are there other things you recommend for families uh, to kind of keep, keep a habit of play or curiosity or fun going with the, the relationship? I mean, I think anytime that you can like just be with your child without those expectations is really, really important. And I think like as much as you can maybe put up, put aside like outside, you know, stimuli or, you know, distractions and just kind of be in the moment with your child, the better, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can probably find like five, 10, like five minutes a day to just connect with your child too. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. The play sessions too. Like, I know they sound like they are kind of geared for younger kids, but there are ways of maintaining it. Even as your child gets older, you know, even as they become like preteens, teenagers, maybe it's not 30 minutes a week that they're playing, but maybe it turns into a weekly walk where the child gets to just talk and be, um, and you're just there reflecting and listening, um, as opposed to advice giving and questioning, Mm -hmm. you know, it can, it can evolve as the child gets older and, and, you know, maybe it does like fall off the wagon a little bit here and there, but just remembering that you can always pick it back up. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't just because it's kind of like exercise just because you miss a day or miss a week doesn't mean like you never exercise again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with ADHD in general, I think, uh, Consistently inconsistent is a term that I've heard out there, but just putting that effort into things that are valuable to you, things that build joy in your life and that build those relationships. Um, It's more about like focused on building that relationship than it is about a have to so rigid at a certain time. Right. And I think maybe what I was going to say before I lost my train of thought might have been along the lines of, you know, in school, kids are losing so much more playtime now. Like kids, like schools are constantly stripping away art, music, PE, recess, in favor of more structured academic time, which is actually not what kids, that they're not needing that. They're, They're like, that's not what they need. They actually need to be playing more because that's how they learn and that's how they process, but they're losing more and more of that. And so like, it's even more important now to have that structure, that structured, unstructured time at home. Oh, of course, of course. And just having creative outlets, I know for me and for a lot of the clients that I work with, their creativity is their strength. And, Mm -hmm. you know, having that ability, if, if art and music and theater and all those things are stripped from school. Um, having time for that at home is so important. And, you know, you may not be able to pay for all the outside classes, but it's something that parents can do with their children or their teens at home too. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with kids who have ADHD, they probably like mm-hmm. need that on that, that playtime at school more than anybody else, but they're not getting it, you know, so they don't have that opportunity to kind of burn that excess energy off. <laughs> yeah. Burn the hyperactivity fuel. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Fidget toys can be something and yeah. there are some accommodations. I like the IEPs and the 504 plans that allow some kind of a ways for children to let out their energy, but yeah, it's not the same as having a gym class or having an art class or music. So exactly. Well, Kat, you've really made me start thinking a lot about that, that relationship between play and relationships, uh, well, family relationships in general, and how important it is. And, and the fact that your coaching program helps parents learn how to do this. And it's almost like you're teaching the tools and then kind of giving them some feedback, and then they're going to keep these tools going for many years to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I recommend it over, you know, maybe therapy for your child, because, you know, it's going to give you all the skills in the forefront. And then like therapy is something that goes on for a long time, like it's ongoing. And so it's a cost that you're paying for 
ongoing. So it's like, or you could, you know, pay to do my coaching program, get all the tools up front and keep refining them for your, your child's life and any other children that you have, you know, like it, tra- it translates to all children. Yeah. What it, so what if you have a parent that says, I've tried everything. I'm too stressed out. Ah, like, how do you sell them on that play can help them too? How do you, what do you say to that? Like if you're stressed, kids, kids absorb stress from their parents. So like, if you're stressed, your kids feeling stressed and that's leading to bigger behavioral problems, you know, that your child is having. And so if you can learn these skills to de-stress or de-escalate with them during this playtime, like, you're going to help your child and your family in the long run. Yeah. yeah. And, help, and help your stress level or help a parent's stress level too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's meant to be fun. You know, these play sessions, they're meant to be fun. Mm-hmm. I want to come. I'm ready. <laughs> I will. Let me ask you if people want to work with you more, find out more about your coaching program. Where do they go? What website? Et cetera. Yeah. So my website is called parenting w play.com so it's parenting with play but it's parenting w play.com and then my instagram is pocket parent coach because i i like to call myself the parent coach in your pocket uh, because in addition to like the times we meet you also have the ability to kind of be in touch with me throughout the the program um and then my facebook is parenting w play love it well, I truly love what you're doing. And I think that those tools are essential to parents, children, even parents with ADHD, children with ADHD. It, it can really make a huge ripple effect of difference in this world. So thank yes. you again for being on my YouTube today. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Of course. Bye, Kat. Take care. Bye. Thank you.